Um, so it's useful in this sense to look a little bit to, to Poincaré's uh, career. And uh, so I will be talking about here, about uh, 1898, when you write a paper on the stability of the solar system. And uh, so Poincaré, before that, he started to, to work. He, he was very much interested on one problem, which is the equilibrium of uh, fluid mass. And that was after reading the work of uh, Georges Darwin in 1880. And uh, he started to work on Lindstedt equations. And this started really on a small mathematical equation. And he looked to the, to the divergence of, of, the, of the series that, that were used in this resolution of this solution. And it's through that that after he was interested really in celestial mechanics problem, and uh, which culminate with uh, the, the paper given by the, the prize of uh, Oscar of, of Sweden. And uh, so it's in which was then published in uh, 1890 on the problem of the three body and the equation of uh, dynamics. And after that, he was really involved in uh, celestial mechanics and in which uh, uh, main work is the three volume of the New, nouvelle méthode de la, de la mécanique céleste. And uh, at the same time, if you look to his uh, professional activity, he was the first at uh, Sorbonne professor of mathematical physics and probability. But then in uh, 1896, after the death of Tisserand, he was on the chair of professor of mathematical astronomy and celestial mechanics. The, this chair was, in fact, uh, made for uh, Le Verrier and was then occupied by Cauchy and Puiseux. And uh, this is also for his uh, academic career. In 88, 87, he was elected member of the Academy of Science. And then, uh, through all his involvement in celestial mechanics and astronomy, he was also elected in 93 as a member of the Bureau des Longitudes, where he occupied himself with lots of practical problems uh, of astronomy, but also of geodesy, and really uh, linked to uh, practical astronomy, I would say. So the paper I'm starting is, in fact, published in uh, the Annal, the Annuaire of the Bureau des Longitudes. He, it was when he was there. And uh, at the end of this Annuaire, there are some scientific paper for general audience. And the one, this one was uh, published in 87, and it's on the stability of the solar system. And this paper was, in fact, uh, uh, you know, it's a popular paper, but it was reprinted immediately in uh, three languages. It was reprinted in, uh, in a scientific journal in French, but it was also reprinted in Nature, and it was reprinted in a German equivalent journal in uh, Science. So I take the translation in Nature here of the same date. All persons who are in who interest themselves in the progress of celestial mechanics, but can only follow it in a general way, must feel surprised at the number of times demonstration of the stability of the solar system have been made. Yes, usually one thinks that a single demonstration is sufficient in mathematics. So that, he says, Lagrange was the first to establish it. Poisson then gave a new proof. Afterwards, other demonstrations came, and others will still come. Were the old demonstration insufficient, or are the new one unnecessary? The astonishment of this person would doubtless be increased if they were told that perhaps someday a mathematician would show by rigorous reasoning that the planetary system is unstable. So I think it's, what is very impressive is uh, the how in a condensed way and uh, in a very uh, simple way everything is uh, written. In fact, the problem of the stability was a very big problem at the 
in the 19th century, but it was also a very big problem in science in the 18th century. And it started with Newton. And uh, with Newton, when he wrote in the, in the optic books, and this is the version, this is the second edition in English, because there was a first edition in 1706, but this was in Latin, and I don't read Latin. But the, the paper I quote would be in, uh, the same as in the Latin edition. It's in the volume of optics, but in the volume of optics, at the end of the volume, he writes various thoughts about uh, gravitation. He just takes the opportunity that he's making this publication to give his, uh, his thought about gravitation. And uh, in particular, this is what he writes. He, he, in fact, he will say that the fact that all the planet orbits are so well ordered is for him the evidence of the existence of a creator, of God. Because it could not be just by uh, blind faith. You see, for a while, comets move in very eccentric orbs in all manner of position. Blind faith could never make all the planets move one and the same in way in. So that's the proof of existence of God for him. But then he continued. Orbs concentric, some inconsiderable irregularity accepted, which may have risen from the mutual action of comets and planets upon one another, and which will be apt to increase till this system wants a reformation. So that's, that's the, the other part. He thinks, in fact, he, since you have uh, Newton's law, he knows that the, the motion is not Keplerian, that the, the planet, if you have a single planet around the star, OK, you have a Keplerian motion. But then the, when you have two planets, the motion, the orbits are disturbed by the presence of the other one. He cannot compute precisely this perturbation, but uh, he wonder whether this perturbation will disrupt the stability of the system. And in fact, at the time of Newton, there were evidence that it was the case. Because there were old observations that uh, were made by the Greek, and observations made in the 16th century. And they have been analyzed by Kepler in 1725. And Kepler found that, uh, in fact, Jupiter and Saturn were not behaving properly. Jupiter was going toward the sun, and Saturn was going away from the sun. So there was some evidence of instability. And I think that when he speaks about this, uh, uh, this um, inequality, this alternation, it refers to that. And this was a big question. In fact, this was the cause of, of a dispute with Leibniz. Leibniz thought that this was really thinking uh, uh, very little of the power of God. And he warned, he sent a letter to, uh, to the Caroline, the princess of Wales, to warn her not to listen to uh, Newton's word and to the follower. You know, Newton and his follower have a very odd opinion regarding <laughs> God's workmanship. According to them, God's watch, the universe, would stop working if he didn't rewind it from time to time. He didn't have enough foresight to give it perpetual motion. So you see, that, that's the, the point. You know, if that he cannot, Leibniz cannot think that in, uh, in Newton's world, God is a very poor wa watchmaker. So, and it cannot be true. So, you know, the power of God should be uh, infinite, and he should have made a solar system that is stable, infinitely stable. So you see, you have this, uh, this big uh, problem, because stating the stability of the solar system is basically stating the existence of God. So this is why this problem was so important, or one of the reasons why it was so important at the time. It was also another question, which was, 
whether Newton's law could actually uh, explain completely the motion of the celestial bodies. And uh, this problem was solved by uh, Laplace. In fact, in his uh, comment, Poincaré forgot Laplace. And this is not right, because the first one to do it right was Laplace for the stability of this uh, size of the orbits. And, uh, but then Lagrange, Poisson, you see, this is the continuity of this work. And what, uh, what was the outcome of the work of, of, uh, of these people? It was to say that the orbital semi-major axes are not strictly invariable, but their variation are limited to small amplitude oscillation around their mean value. This is uh, the world of Poincaré. You see, the, the, well, this is what uh, Laplace showed, in fact, is that you have the size of the orbit is strictly invariant, except some oscillation, which may have some, one of them may have a large amplitude because of the close resonance between the motion of Jupiter and Saturn. And if you had observation uh, uh, about uh, 200 before Christ, that's the Greek observation, and new observation here, you had the impression of a trend, but which was just uh, because of this big oscillation due to close commensurability. And in fact, that was a very important result from Laplace, because once he did this, and once he explained this big term here due to the close resonance with Jupiter and Saturn, he was able for the first time, just with Newton's law, to recover all the observation of the past. And he could recover the Greek observation within one minute of arc, which corresponds to the observation with naked eye. And this led to a problem that, in fact, with a single differential equation, you can if modelize everything. You modelize everything, but then the only thing which counts is the uncertainty with which you get the initial condition. And this is the Laplace daemon. Maybe we can lower this a little bit, but which is an intellect which, at a given moment, would know all forces that set nature in motion and all position for all items that compose it would embrace in a single formula the movement of the greatest body of the universe and those of the tiniest atom. Nothing would be uncertain, and the future, like the past, would be present before its eye. So can we uh, lower a little bit the, uh, the screen? No? Oh, OK. OK, if it's not possible, it's not possible. It's not a... I asked it before, too, but it's OK. So, so, the, so you see, this is, this is directly uh, in, with respect to the previous result, which is that with this differential equation, you know the initial condition. You will be able to predict all the future and to recover all the past. So I will come back to the stability of the semi-major axis. And in fact, do it the way Poincaré does it when in his writing in the Méthode Nouvelle. And practically, what does, uh, what, what, what does one, how do we demonstrate the invariance of the semi-major axis? So you have the energy that depend on the semi-major axis, on the longitude, the lambda is for the longitude, the motion of the planet on the orbit, on the other orbital element, eccentricity, uh, inclination, longitude of, of perihelion, longitude of node. So these are constant, these are constant in the Keplerian motion. What, what is, the equation of motion. The equation of motion for the semi-major axis, and here I am, I am just doing, uh, assuming that these two are canonical conjugate, which is not the case, but it's not important. It's something like that. 
what is the proof of the invariance of the semi-major axis? You see, the semi-major axis are not invariant, but they are invariant in average. How do you do that? You just take a transformation that transforms the variable to new variable, and through this transformation, you get a new Hamiltonian that is just the average of the previous one over the longitude. If this is the case, now you look to the variation of the semi-major axis, but here you have average over the longitude. So there are no longitude here. So this is in the new variable is zero. So this is a demonstration of Laplace, which was first given by Euler with some error, then by Lagrange with some error. Of course, this is not completed, because what you have written here is a variation in the new variable, in the average problem, and you have to put the relation between the old variable, the real variable, and the new variable here. And this will be a prime plus wa plus, this is just an exponential LW, and W is your generating function. So this is just, so this is LWA, and then And then this is just an exponential series. So practically, this is a work which can be made as an infinite series, and these are the series of celestial mechanics. So this is this series of celestial mechanics, and then, of course, you search W as W1, epsilon W1 plus epsilon squared W2, etc where epsilon is a small parameter. In fact, epsilon is a planetary mass, which is about 1,000 with respect to the solar mass. So what is the demonstration of Laplace and Lagrange? The demonstration of Laplace and Lagrange is this one, plus saying that the old variable is a new variable plus term that have of order one with respect to the mass, which is written here. So this is Laplace and Lagrange. Then there is a work by Poisson, to which uh, Poincaré refers. It's a 80-page paper, which demonstrates in one line here, you can do it in one line, that just this average is zero. But of course, Poincaré, uh, La, Poincaré does it like that. Poisson does it in 80 pages. Just because here, we are in the right formalism. And then there was a big, big question. The term of second order here. So, so you see, Poincaré says that. Is it, he says, this was what's shown by Lagrange and Laplace. But Poisson went further. He wanted to study the slow change of the mean value. He demonstrated that this change can be reduced to periodic oscillation around the mean value that was submitted to variations that were 1,000 times slower. This was a step forward, but it remained only an approximation. So the first proof of the stability is just this one. Second proof, this term is zero. Remains variation of order two. And there was a big question whether there were still variations there, secular variations there. And in fact, this question came to an end when RSU showed that, in fact, this is not zero. The average value of this term is not zero. In fact, uh, before that, uh, Mathieu thought he succeeded to show that it was null, but Spirou Aretu then demonstrated that it was wrong. But what is the outcome? The fact that these terms are not zero doesn't mean 
it means that there will be variation in the semi-major, at least small variation. But in fact, with all these series, there will still be quasi-periodic variation. And in fact, what uh, Poincaré says, he says he had thus more condemned the old method than demonstrated the instability of the system. The question remains entirely. In fact, one needs also to show that the eccentricities are bounded because if, as here, you have circular motion for the Earth and Mars, you don't change the semi-major axis, but just change the eccentricity, then you can have collision. So you need to look to the uh, variation of the eccentricity. And that was also done by Laplace and Lagrange. In fact, Lagrange here was leading the problem. He gave the right way to do it. And the way to do it is to reduce the problem to a system of differential equation of first order with constant coefficient. So this is made by expanding, expanding this Hamiltonian here in series with respect to eccentricity inclination, keeping only the leading term. And then you end up with a linear system of differential equation, which solution is, he demonstrated then that the eigenvalue of this matrix are all distinct and positive, and not positive, but real. And thus, you have a quasi-periodic motion, like this one for the Earth, you know, the eccentricity longitude of perihelion of the Earth is a sum of periodic terms, and I will call the frequency G, G1, Gn, uh, like that. And the frequency for the inclination will be called S. So when you put that together, you get some variation for the eccentricity of the planet. You get that the, the orbit presses, you have change in eccentricity and inclination, but this change were bounded. This was computed by Lagrange. And uh, as uh, Poincaré says, concerning the other orbital elements, as eccentricity and inclination, they can show a rounded their mean value larger and slower oscillation, but for which one can compute some limits. Of course, compute some limit to first order. So it's just here to show you how series are introduced in celestial mechanics and that they are truncated in a very crude way to give one result. Just to give you a better view of that, this is the real solar system with the real planet, you see, Mercury, Venus, the Earth, and, and Mars. This is the time, here already 200,000 years have passed. You see the change, in the sh you don't see much the eccentricity, you see more that the orbit is shifted and uh, that the sun is always at, uh, at the center. So in space, you see more that there is some motion. At least you see there is, there is some motion, that the orbits are not fixed, that you have a dynamical system, and then you need to wonder about the stability of these orbits. When you see them like that, you even wonder how can they stay, you see. Here the planets are not at their position. It's, they are put at the position of perihelion. And you see here Mercury, the perihelion of Mercury is just changing slowly for the motion of the other planet. It's a more complicated motion. And uh, so you see that things are moving. And that's what we get at the end of the 18th century. And you see that there was this big effort, big effort showing that all these terms were uh, of average, of zero average. And this took 200 years. So, so what is the comment of Poincaré? He says, all these studies have required great effort that seem useless today. The method of Mr. Gilden and those of Mr. Lindstedt, indeed, so far as you push the approximation, give only periodic terms so that all orbital elements can only experience oscillation around their mean value. The question would be solved if this expansion were convergent. Unfortunately, we know that this is not the case. And we know this is since the memoir of uh, Oscar, uh, the, the memoir on the three-body problem done by Poincaré, 
where he showed that, uh, as was uh, shown in detail by uh, Rick Mokel uh, uh, two days ago, that these were these very complicated feature in the, in the dynamical system because the um, stable and unstable manifold uh, were not, uh, did not coincide and, and then, and what is impressive is that also he says that he will not describe this figure, he, he, will, not, he will not draw this figure, he is able to describe the figure in a complete detail and um, you cannot believe that he did not draw it at some point on a, on a small piece of paper because I cannot understand how he will be able to say something like that. You see this intersection for a kind of lattice of fabric, an infinitely tight mesh network, each of the two curves, the stable and unstable uh, manifold must not intersect itself but must fall back onto itself in a very complex way to come across an infinite number of time all the meshes of the network. So, so he described exactly what arise. He, and he said that uh, orbit there will be highly unstable. Then, then there was a, the problem is like that he lost the stability of the system he lost the possibility to prove the stability of the solar system. So at one time, he, he made this theorem of recurrence, which uh, in a sense is a, a, another form of stability. This is what he calls stability à la poisson, but it's a very weak form because it just says that if you start within some initial condition, after a time which can be very long, it would come back in the vicinity of the same initial condition. And obviously, that was not sufficient for the search of stability, because he will come back to this problem, and he will search for a different form of stability. And this is uh, what I am uh, speaking now. Because he, he will say that this material point, the, the problem with this material point, is a, is a mathematical problem. And we are looking for the stability of the real solar system. So. And the real celestial objects are not material points. And they are subject to other forces than the Newtonian attraction. The effect of these complementary forces should be to alter gradually the orbit, even through the fictitious object considered by the mathematician would enjoy absolute stability. And the force he's thinking of is the tidal forces, tidal forces in, uh, in the solar system. And uh, this is because uh, it was after the work of George Darwin in uh, 1880. And uh, George Darwin has been the one who has explained why the moon is always facing us, because of tidal dissipation between the, in, among the Earth's moon system, which makes the rotation slow down until it is synchronized with the Earth. And uh, so we must then ask whether this stability will be more quickly destroyed by the simple effect of Newtonian attraction or by these complementary forces. So that's the big question. Whether the tidal forces, the dissipative force, are more important than the, basically the diffusion due to the nonlinearity of the neglected term in the expansion here. And then he says, without wanting to quote figure, I think this effect, the effect of these complementary forces are much larger than those of the term neglected by analysts in the latest demonstration of the stability. So this one, you see, the term neglected, the third order term or fourth order. Uh, and what will be the outcome of, the, of this tidal friction? So tidal friction, so the, the Earth or the, the Moon or the Sun will deform the Earth here make a bulge in the direction of the, of the body here, the perturbing body. The, the, but as if the planet rotates faster than the moon, for example, around the Earth, then there will be a permanent offset in this bulge. And the attraction of the moon on the bulge no longer goes through the center of the Earth and tend to slow down the rotation of our globe. But here, Poincaré is wrong. The problem is that the effect is true. The effect exists. 
So there is no doubt that there is some this effect, the tidal effect is there. And what, what Poincaré thinks is that this effect happens as long as, as the orbits are not synchronized with their rotation. That after, so after an infinite time, what will happen? The solar system would therefore tend to a limit state where the sun, all the planets, and their satellites revolve with the same speed about the same axis as if they were part of the same invariant solid. So he thinks that at the end, all the solar system will end to a system where all planets will be uh, rotating as a solid with the sun. The problem is just the time scale. If you look, if you make a small computation, you will find for Sun Mercury, for example, that in 300 million years, the rotation of Mercury is synchronized with its orbit. But if you make the computation, for example, for Jupiter, and you want to know in how much time the rotation of the Sun will be synchronized with the orbit of Jupiter, you find that it's 210 to the power 16 giga year. So, so we, have, we have something, but the time scale is not right. So that's, uh, end up, and in fact, this dissipative effect is much smaller than the diffusion due to the uh, Newton interaction. But after Poincaré, so at the time here, after Poincaré, this is where Poincaré left it. You know, he said, going further, asserting that these elements will be not only stay for a long time, now he referred to pure Newtonian problem without the dissipation, but always between narrow limits, this is what we cannot do. So the question of stability in infinite time, the question uh, of Leibniz, you know, Leibniz was saying, God should have made a solar system that is stable in infinite time. And this is what came back with KM theorem. So, so basically, uh, the, the, the question, the problem is uh, for the 18th and 19th century, it was like that, just pure rotation or combination of this pure rotation. But then Poincaré showed that there were this complicated behavior in the vicinity of the resonance. And then there was this result of Kolmogorov, who demonstrated that uh, despite all this exists, there are still some initial conditions for which you have regular quasi-periodic solution that would be stable in infinite time, so following Leibniz's requirement. So, and this rigorous result, so Kolmogorov did it in a general way, then Arnold showed that it applied to a two-planet planar problem. Uh, one of my students, Philippe Robutel, uh, showed that it was possible to extend it to spatial case. And also, there are some more recent results by uh, Herman and Fejoz and Kirkia Pinzari, who showed that this was also possible for n-planet spatial case. So everything is fine. You can apply. You can have infinitely stable quasi-periodic solution, but only in a very small, extremely small value of the masses and eccentricity and inclination, which doesn't apply to the solar system. So to get results for the solar system, you need to put the equation on computer, and the computer result will show the contrary. They will show that it's not stable, and that the first the first way to show it's not stable is just to look how it diverge solution. And in fact, they diverge exponentially, like 10 to the power t over 10, where t is in million of years. Which means that every 10 million years, you lose one digit. So if you start here with 15 meter accuracy, after 10 million years, you have 150 meter accuracy. But after 100 million years, you have 150 million kilometer error. So that's the first thing. It's even worse. So because here you could say, OK, it's diverging exponentially. But still, if I have an infinitely precise initial condition, I, will go, I can go to infinity. But the problem is the more 
you will try to be precise, the more you will have to take into account features. And what uh, we could show is that the presence of uh, the asteroid, and particularly of the largest of them, Vesta and Ceres, which are very teeny, you know, just uh, around 22,000 of the Earth's mass, this will strictly limit the solution to about 60 million years because these two asteroids perturb the planets and they have themselves a chaotic motion at a much shorter time scale than the planets. What is 10 million years for the planets is just 50,000 years for these uh, two bodies, which means that after, after 400,000 years, you don't know where are these two bodies. So you have an error that you cannot reduce. And if you want to improve a solution, say, for example, that 15 meter error in the planet motion and the orbital motion or initial condition of the asteroid give you a solution that is given valid of over 60 million years. If you want to go further, you will need to improve the motion of the asteroids, which have a chaotic time scale of 50,000 years. So if you improve everything by a factor of 1,000, you go to 15 millimeter, then you will only be able to predict over 60 million and 150,000 years. You say, no wonder we go to micrometer level. And I will let you guess how far we can go. <laughs> you can do it. You, there are several ways of reasoning. You can just try to understand you can just make a linear approximation, and then you get the result in the same way. So here we see that there is, in fact, a limit to, La, to Laplace daemon. And the only thing which was, in fact, foreseen by Poincaré is that in this case, you have to look to not only to single trajectory, but you have to look to the vicinity of this trajectory. You have to look globally, and you have to look, you have to go to a statistical view. You have to, uh, so you, you have to look more globally. You, I will not take now a single trajectory. I will take a local vicinity of the trajectory and see the behavior of this trajectory. In this case, I know that after 60 million years, the trajectory are not the trajectory of the solar system, but I can go statistically and look to what are the outcomes. So this is what we did recently with 2,000 solutions, which we computed over 5 billion years, for the whole solar system with everything in it that you can imagine. It took a lot of CPU time, about 7 million hours of CPU. And what we get is this. That's for the eccentricity of Mercury. You see, most of them, for most of them, the eccentricity is changed, but doesn't, this is the maximum value of the eccentricity, doesn't go much beyond 0.4. But for 22 cases, 21 cases here, you had a very big increase of Mercury's eccentricity. When you look to one of these increases, I look here to one increase. It was in another simulation, so it's in the reverse time. It's just to, to see that you had this relatively regular behavior, and suddenly an increase to 0.8. So the first question was to understand why do you have this increase? And in fact, the reason is because you have, you saw the perihelion of Mercury. It was moving quite well, quite regularly. But in fact, you didn't notice that it was about the same speed as the perihelion of Jupiter. Perihelion of Mercury is, uh, is 5.5 5 arc second per year. Perihelion of Jupiter is 4.25 arc second per year. They are not so close, but close. But you have all the other interactions, which make a diffusion of the, of the value of the frequency of Mercury, of, uh, perihelion of Mercury. So it will change. And the problem is, as soon as it goes close to the one of, of Jupiter, you will have a resonance, and then you will have this big increase in the eccentricity of Mercury. We look more precisely to this. 
you see, here is an example. You have in four million years, you have this increase of the eccentricity of Mercury. And if you look at the same time to the semi-major axis, you see that the semi-major axis has not changed. It, ha it has not changed. It really uh, doesn't move until you go here. But here, it's because you have close encounter with Venus. So when you have close encounter with Venus, then you have any kind of thing. So we look to uh, how can we, you know, thinking of, um, you know, mathematicians, they want always to be able to prove things. So you, you want what, here we have a dynamical system that is 30 degrees of freedom with phase space of dimension 60, lots of secular interaction, lots of resonance. But we wanted to look for a simple model to explain the eccentricity of Mercury, and I'm speaking of it because it went out two days ago. So it's a good opportunity. What we look is the minimal feature needed to explain this big change in the eccentricity of Mercury. And the minimal feature, it's uh, what, what we do. We average over the mean longitude, which puts the semi-major axis constant, but you saw that this was actually the case. They don't move. So we do things like that. Then we develop, we expand. We expand, but we want to go to high eccentricity of Mercury. So we don't want to expand in, in this eccentricity. So we put it exact in eccentricity, but we will use the other planet as a forcing term. We take for granted the motion of the other planet. So all of them are just expanded up to degree one in eccentricity. And even this is a lot of degree of freedom. We will limit it to only one argument. So you consider the motion of Mercury perturbed with the other planet only in their component, which is related to this resonance, which we have already isolated as a leading term in that. The problem is we still have to expand everything up to order 50 in order to be realistic because uh, we want a realistic system. So it's simple because you have only one degree of freedom left here, one action variable and one angle. So it's a one degree of freedom system, quite complicated because you have all these terms that appear, but they are just polynomial expression of the eccentricity. Just the computation is complicated. The, uh, when you think of it, it's just a one degree of freedom system. You can just write the phase space, and this is what it is. You see, you recover the picture of Poincaré. It's a resonant, you put it in resonance here. And you see that as you have this resonance, if you have an orbit, eccentricity is a distance from the center. If you have an orbit which is here, it will be of low eccentricity here, but then it will go here to high eccentricity. And when you compare the outcome here with the, this is the true solution with dimension 60 uh, phase space. This is a dimension two phase space of this small, small thing, and you get exactly the same behavior with the same time scale, starting with the same initial condition. So it's just here that not only we get the numerical uh, feature on the full system, but we get the leading uh, aspect of it. And then you can make it a little bit more, but here, of course, it's integrable. You don't have chaos. If you want to get chaos, you just add a degree of freedom. So we get, but went to a special problem. We just, uh, we add not a full special problem. We just add one harmonic in the, in the special problem because we knew it was important from other studies. Then you get a two degree of freedom system. And then the phase space will be like that. And then, so you have, as expected by uh, Poincaré and by others, you have a chaotic zone around the separatrix here, and then you will have intermittency between slow, low uh, eccentricity of Mercury and high eccentricity excursion of Mercury. And uh, when you look to that, this is uh, the kind of orbit you have. You see, you have diffusion of the, of the, eccentri of the eccentricity of Mercury, then you will go to resonance with Jupiter, which will put Mercury into high eccentricity, and then you may have then interaction with the other planets. And um, coming back to the uh, solution to this experiment, we, which we did, 
I told you that we had 21 solutions with high eccentricity of mercury, so the, the one which went to resonance. Out of them, we had six collision mercury with Venus, nine collision of mercury with the sun, five rich five billion years before collision. And one is interesting because there was a close encounter, not a collision, but a close encounter of, of, uh, of Mars with, uh, with the Earth. And you see, this close encounter is at about 80, 800 kilometers. So it will be beautiful, you know. That. <laughs> but again, this is, a, this is a single trajectory. This is a single trajectory. You start here, and just you, you nearly miss it. At 3.4 billion years, you nearly miss it. So what you can go, you, you go a little bit before, 3 million years before, you start here, and you want to have a statistical view of it. So you take a vicinity of initial condition, and you look to the outcome of these various solutions. Here you are in a region of highly chaotic behavior because you have plenty of encounter. And this is what we did with just changes 0.15 millimeter in the semi-major axis of Mars. And this is then what you get. You get anything, collision of Mercury with the Sun, collision of Mars with the Sun, of Mercury with Venus, Mercury with the Earth, Mercury with Mars, Venus with the Earth, Venus with Mars, Earth with Mars, and five ejections of Mars because Mars went too close to Jupiter. And now I will just show you all this in two minutes. I'm, I'm two minutes ahead of my time, but I will nevertheless let it. So this is the present behavior of the planets, uh, as before. The time still here, 300,000 years. And uh, you see that there will be the diffusion of the, of the uh, orbit of Mercury, diffusion of the frequency of the perihelion, until here you get to resonance with Jupiter, which makes the orbit much more elongated. And then you have, you have increased, by that, you have increased very much the eccentricity of Jupiter. And once it's increased, you can collide with Venus if you want. But if you don't do it, you can then exchange angular momentum with the other planet. And this is what happened here. So you reduce the eccentricity of Mercury, but all the eccentricity of the other planets are increased. And in this case, you have all this, uh, this behavior. Not that you don't necessarily have co collision, because this is a projection of a special problem. And to need a collision, you need that the planet be at the same time at the same moment. So you will have to wait a little bit. And you will see, for example, that interesting thing can happen. Like here you have Venus, here you have the Earth. When you will have close encounter between the two, then you may have exchange between the two orbits. And the orbit of, uh, you see, it happened just like. The orbit of the Earth is now inner to the orbit of Venus. So you have nice climatic change on the Earth at the time. <laughs> And if you wait enough, then you will have several of these close encounters. And after you have close encounter enough, you have things like that. You see, collision of Mars with the Earth. And we try to figure out what it would look like. You know, we didn't have uh, So it's not a documentary. <laughs> it's not a, and, and you can even have this. You can have a collision of Venus with, with the Earth. So you see, uh, and this was just by changing by 0.15 millimeters the position of Mars. So I think I can conclude on this sentence of Poincaré that uh, it can happen that small difference in the initial condition lead to very big change in the final result. And you see, big change it would be for us in this case. Thanks. Are there any questions or comments?
So because of the collisions, the motion is not reversible. So I would like to know if you made these kind of simulations in the past rather than the future. Yes, I, I made, in fact, uh, I, the first work I did like that was uh, in 15 years ago, maybe even more. The more it goes, the more it's uh, before. You know, it was 1994. And I did it at the beginning using average equation. Average equation, like doing this analytical averaging like that. And I showed at the time that Mercury's eccentricity could go to very high value and could eventually come into collision with Venus. But I could not demonstrate that it would go completely to collision because uh, when you make perturbation series, the, when you go close to collision, there is divergence of the series. Uh, you, wouldn't, you even, that, wouldn't that mean a collision in the past? Yes, but just tell me. I, I, I'm just going to answer the question. The problem is at the time I sent the paper showing collision in the past, and I even integrated, you know, I was too much influenced by mathematician, and I thought that everybody would be the same. And I was making an integration of the solar system 10 billion years in the past. Okay. And showing that collision is possible 6 billion years in the past. And that was too much for the editor, you know. That's <laughs> because if you are doing that, basically you have a dynamical system. The, in this case, a, a chaotic system like that. If you integrate in the future or in the past, it's exactly the same thing, apart from the small dissipative term, but it's exactly the same thing. You have diffusion. When you look at it, you have diffusion in the two, in the two way. So now, after this experience, I prefer to integrate in the future <laughs> because of the didactical. I know that it's a more... Uh, understandable for common people. But of course, you, you can have. The interesting thing here is when you look to the probability of collision, or probability to have a very high eccentricity of Mercury, it's about 1%. So it means that over 5 billion years. So it means that the probability that everything went smooth and a little bit like it is now is 99%. So we have, we have a very coherent view, which means that uh, you, you would not be able to, to... Because the problem is, if, you, if I had found that the probability to lose Mercury was 50% or 60%, it, it would have been a, a problem. You know, how can you explain that Mercury is still here? So does it answer your question? Uh, no, 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 I didn't have an answer. If you take your film and you, you run it in the negative time, it, it will look strange. Uh, the, yes, because the so, problem is to get the initial condition for the... If so I, I, just if want, I take, I just if I take know, this... Are there accidents? If I take this and I leave it like that, I cannot go back. I'm, I, I'm okay, I, I understand that. I don't have the initial condition to go back. Mm -hmm. Is this what you mean? Not really. I mean, uh, you are suggesting that some collisions are possible in the future. And some collisions have been... By the same argument, you could, you could argue that there are some accidents in the past. That's right. But I want to understand what kind of accidents would it be? It a could be, for example, at the, end, at the end of the formation of the solar system. You s what you see here is that the system is unstable, but it's marginally unstable, I would say. That it's collision are possible, but they are difficult. You need about the time of the life of the system. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the formation of the solar system, you may have had additional planets. And then the system wa was much highly unstable. Any, if you had anything there, it would be highly unstable. And for example, you could have an, ad, an additional planet uh, around, uh, around Mars. Then you would have a collision. And in fact, we had the evidence that the moon was most probably formed by such a collision. So, and once you get a collision, in fact, the system after, and I did the experiment with that, is more stable. Because basically, to get this collision, you had to put all eccentricity in one of the body. When you put the collision, when you get the collision, then you have removed a part, basically a part of the nonlinearity of the system in this collision. And you have a, a new system which is much more stable than the next one, than the previous one. 
have Other a question, questions? because at the time scale you are working, considering the sun as a stable object is, uh, is really not realistic, because really... Well, you have a small, a small dissipation, the, the loss of the mass of the sun, it's 10 minus 14 per year, so it would be... Uh, here all, already I, may, I put a, a dissipative effect, which is, the, uh, which is largest, in fact, which is the dissipation in the Earth-Moon system. It makes a small dissipation in the system. And, but I didn't put the, the, the loss of the mass of the sun because it was very, it's very small. It's still a, it won't change anything here. But it make, when you do this kind of computation, you want to be able that you are making the computation wide. So it was important to be able to track precisely the energy of the system. And I didn't want to have complications due to the loss of the mass of the sun. If, here, all the energy is conserved up to 10 minus 10 at the end of the 55 billion years. So that's very tricky. And uh, in some cases, you, you don't want to, you don't want to uh, add any additional problem. But I don't think, I could say you can do it again, but you, you have to waste 7 million years of CPU just to verify that it's the same thing. Other questions? If, uh, I come back to the question of ATNGs. If you run the equations backward... Yes, which I do currently. Uh, it, we did it forward okay. and backward. Okay. You get so, the same result. Now, do you get a hint of the fact that the, the Earth and the Moon at some point were the same object? Or just no, separate by because, collision? No, because that's, uh, this will be... You, you get in some sense a hint, but that's when, when you look. You don't need to integrate over 5 billion years. You need to integrate over a lower time. Then you get... You, you basically input the present tidal dissipation in the Earth-Moon system. But if you take the present tidal dissipation in the Earth-Moon system, which is measured by uh, laser ranging from the Earth to the Moon, you get very precise measurement. At three point, the Moon is going out at 3.8 centimeter per year. You put this tidal dissipation term. But if you run backward with that, with the, the present model we, we have for tidal dissipation, then you get a hit of the moon with uh, the Earth 1.5 billion years ago, which is obviously wrong. So the usual way to overcome this problem is to say that this, we are in a presently in a, in a particularly strong tidal dissipation because it depends on the organization of the ocean. It uh, depends on the repartition of the sea. So the, the general assumption is that, in average, it was smaller in the past. But you, you have to make all these kind of assumptions to, to basically get a factor of three, which would put back the, the heat at uh, 4.5 billion years. But this is uh, all unknown. You know, there is a lot of uncertainty. We are, so, so you don't take this into consideration in this problem here. This is why also making the integration in the future, you don't have this problem because the more you go, the less you have uh, this tidal dissipation, and you can, uh, I, you can uh, modelize it in a very uh, simple way. Other questions? Is the effect of dark matter entered or not? What is the correction for dark matter? Ah, the problem, I would say in general, is. Uh, is the question was, what's the problem if there is some dark matter? The problem from the beginning is how good is the dynamical model that is used here? That, that's the question. And that's a question which we, we wanted to be very uh, sure of. So I, I show you computations that are made of a billion of years. But in order to get the model and in order to get the initial condition, we also build a complete, the most accurate model you could think of, which means a model that takes into account all possible observations, which means so it's a model that is run for, for, for space research and for astronomical reduction of observation. This model is directly compared to observation, which means we observation are, for example, there is a spacecraft around Mars, which gives signal to the Earth, and you get the distance from Mars to the Earth at a precision that is uh, below five meters. For the Venus, it's the same. For the Moon, we have a few centimeters due to the laser ranging. 
So we put all this together, something like 50,000 observations. We have all this in the model, all the comparison to all this. And from this, we cannot discriminate, we cannot put any additional change in the, we don't need any additional change for the gravitational model. For example, we could uh, show that some uh, alternate gravitational model, like a MOND model, are not possible because of the constraint given by the dynamics in the solar system. So, so that, that, that's the point. At the level of the solar system, we don't have the space for any additional uh, model. Any other questions? And that's by comparing directly to observation. So then this high accurate model is used, is integrated for one million years, and we use it as a start to fit this long-term model. So they, be, they compare the two of them over one million years compare uh, very precisely. So it's not, it's not a toy model. It, it's a model that is uh, uh, the, in best agreement with the best observation of, of the planet that we can have now. Let us thank the speaker again.